Okay, so thank you for clicking your way through to this talk um, and for the organizers for inviting me to give it. Um, this talk is going to be on some of the theory behind debris disks and how we can use observations of those disks to tell us about their planetary systems. Um, there's going to be an, another companion talk on, uh, on the observations themselves by uh, Alicia Weinberger that I would encourage you to go and uh, go and see. And I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the observations in, in this talk, though of course some mention is necessary. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Mark Wyatt uh, from the University of Cambridge. Uh, without further ado, let's um, let's start. So, uh, so what is a, a debris disk? Um, this is not a, a straightforward question, no, not straightforward as you might think, even for someone like myself who's been working in the field for over two decades. Um, for those of you who are studying protoplanetary disks, it's probably natural to think of a, a debris disk as a descendant of a protoplanetary disk. Protoplanetary disk, disks being the disks found around young stars that have large amounts of, of gas and dust within them and within which planet formation processes are ongoing. Uh, a debris disk is an older, uh, is the disk found around older stars that have, um, that also have dust and, and gas within them, but not as much. And studying de debris disks from that perspective is very fruitful. It tells us about how protoplanetary disks disperse, tells us about disk evolution and about pl planet formation processes. But for a large part for this talk, I'm going to be considering that whatever planet formation processes took place within a protoplanetary disk, they've run their course. And by the time we're looking at the system, then it is left with, uh, the star is left with a system of planets plus um, plus debris, and that's the other perspective which it, of a debris disk, which is that it's simply the non-planetary component of the planetary system. It's anything you find around a star that's not planets. So for the solar system, its debris disk is made up of um, the comets that are orbiting the sun in the Kuiper belt outside the orbit of, of Neptune. Um, we also have the asteroid belt inside the orbit of Jupiter, <coughs> and we have the the, the dust and gas that comes from the breakup of those, uh, those planetesimals. This is just to summarize the, the observables that, that we have of a debris, what might we be uh, using to try and uh, interpret something about the planetary system so that we're all on the same page. Uh, most debris have been observed and discovered using photometry, where we look at the SED, the, the spectrum flux versus wavelength of the star, which we expect to look like this. And we see this extra emission that comes from, from dust that's orbiting the star. It's heated by the star and then re-radiates that, that emission. The temperature of, the, uh, of this excess tells us something about where how far away the dust is from the star. But um, for those disks that are near enough and bright enough, we can image them and then we can get see exactly where the, the the dust is and tell something about the structure of these disks. And this is what I'm mostly going to be talking about in, in, this, in this talk. Uh, we can also discover dust that's closer, um, closer to, the, to the star. Um, we can look at this, this region here. If we find clever ways of, of subtracting the star and nulling interferometry as done by the LVTI is one example of, of this. Where we can look at mid infrared uh, emission very close to the star. Um, spectroscopy, when done at low resolution, simply fills out the, the SED. Um, but at high resolution, we can detect um, can detect gas lines, either in absorption, these have been detected either in absorption against the, the star and have been inferred to, that from these that there are exocomets uh, passing in front of the star. And they've also, gas has also been seen in emission, showing that there's gas coincident with uh, many of these many of these disks. And piecing together all these observations, this uh, cartoon uh, here shows a, a summary of what we've learned about the planetary systems that you might want to hold in your mind as we go through the, the talk. We have these, uh, these belts, which, most of which uh, have been, uh, are, could be considered as Kuiper belt analogs uh, because they are belts of planetesimals that are at tens of, of AU from the star. So there's a region where you might uh, consider a, a Kuiper belt-like planetesimal belt. There's a halo outside of this that I'll of small dust that I'll get to in a in a moment. Um, some systems have uh, asteroid 
like components. Um, some have dust in the Habersfall zone, and some also have dust very close to the star um, that is uh, not well understood yet. And in, interspersed between these uh, different regions are gaps where there could be planets. But what do we actually know about planets in these, these systems? Well, that's what I want to uh, try and get, uh, get at in, in this talk by describing the ways in which planets inevitably impose structure on, on, on disks. And so um, if we understand how planets could impose structure on disks, we can use structures in disks to tell us uh, about planets. So hopefully with what I'm going to tell you, you will have a better understanding of what we currently know and also what we could know in the future. What's the physics that's going on in uh, debris disks? Well, for the most, uh, uh, most objects in the, in the disk, the dominant process is stellar gravity, and this means that objects are orbiting the star in elliptical orbits. The gravitational perturbations of planets in the system mean that those orbits change with time. For the smallest uh, material in, in the disk, radiation forces become important. This is important for the smallest dust, which are the, which is the, are the objects that dominate our observations. Um, and those dust grains are, are short-lived because of those radiation forces, so we know they must be continually produced by the breakup of bigger objects, and that breakup comes because of collisions in the most part. Um, and these don't affect the orbits, but they do affect how the mass is distributed in the disk. There are some other um, processes that, um, that can become important in certain situations, some of which I'll mention in, in the talk, but otherwise these are the main ones to consider. There's also radiative transfer that we have to take into account, both if we want to work out what the radiation forces are and if we want to understand how these disks will be uh, uh, observed, what the observable properties of the disks are. So it's worth mentioning from the outset that there is no one model that can uh, can model all of these processes together. This it's simply uh, too complicated. There are three main ways that people use to model debris disks. We either follow uh, the individual individual particles in the disks using n-body simulations. Um, for example, you may be familiar with um, the packages such as Mercury or Rebound, which could be used for this for this purpose, and if we, if we do that, then we follow the dynamics very, very faithfully, but um, these codes don't do very well at including collisions. So those collisions have to be uh, accounted for. We can include collisional destruction using what's called a collisional grooming algorithm, where you post-process the n-body simulations and then deplete the mass, you know, the number of particles as a function of time based on how much dust there is, you would predict there to be present. Um, so that's uh, a way of including collisional destruction. Collisional production is much harder to include because as soon as you have a collision, you create new particles, then it's created on a new orbit and there's large numbers of, of particles. Um, there are clever ways uh, uh, to, to get around this. Um, for example, there's a, a model by Kontan Kral that has, uh, has attempted to do this. Um, so we can follow the, the dynamics faithfully, but not the collisions uh, using n-body simulations, or we can use kinetic models to follow um, uh, the collisions faithfully, but not so much the, the dynamics. And in this, we're not considering the evolution of indi individual particles, but the number of particles that are in different parts of the, of the phase space. Um, for example, there's the ACE code by Sasha Grivov's group that you may be familiar with. Um, the third way is to essentially use the results of the other two two models to uh, to or, or analytical considerations to build up an understanding of how the different physical processes interact with each other um, to end up with a, a simpler a model of the of the system, and I'll be using that uh, quite a bit in this this talk for didactical purposes, but mentioning the other uh, the other models uh, as well as as we go. And the radius to transfer aspect is usually considered as a separate step. That is, we work out what the structure of the disk is first and then ask, well, what would that what would that look like? And I'm not going to talk too much about this. There is the hands-on session run by Virginie that uh, you may wish to, to go to to find out more about, uh, about that. So let's start with a, a simple uh, physical picture of a, 
or with debridas. Now let's consider a, a belt of planetesimals that's uh, narrowly, radially confined. For most of the planetesimals, they're just, they just orbit the star until um, they collide with another planetesimal. And when they do, they'll get broken up into smaller fragments that will then go on orbits that, again, continue until they collide with other fragments that then get broken up into smaller fragments until it gets down to the size of dust. And in this way, you get a collisional cascade where the size distribution follows a characteristic slope. So this is the uh, number of things per, per unit, unit size. And we have a power law size distribution coming out of this, where you've got big planetesimals getting broken up into smaller things all the way down to dust. This three and a half slope means that most of the mass is in the biggest objects and most of the cross-sectional area, which is what we see, is in the smallest dust. Now we don't expect this perfect three and a half power law when we consider collisions in more in more detail, but this is a good approximation for now. There are changes in in the slope and wiggles in this size distribution that you can look at these other papers to to find more information about. Now that size distribution has a small size cutoff, and the small size cutoff comes from radiation pressure. Radiation pressure is the uh, the, the radial force that comes from uh, from the radiation, and it's characterized by this beta parameter, which is the ratio of the radiation force to stellar gravity. And it's inversely proportional to particle size, um, and so smaller particles are more affected. And what this means is, if you look at a, uh, a planetesimal that's on a circular orbit and it gets broken up at this point P here, the small dust that gets created gets put on um, different orbits depending on its value of, of beta. If beta is larger than a half, then the dust gets removed immediately. It's put on a hyperbolic unbound trajectory. Um, that dust is so short-lived, we usually don't see it. But for the dust that is, um, that is bound, that has beta of less than a half, smaller than around, uh, that's larger than around a micron in size, then uh, this gets put on elliptical orbits, the apocenter, which extends far beyond the place where it was created with a pericenter in the planetesimal belt where it was created. And this causes this halo that I was referring to earlier. And it, and it explains why when we look at AU MIC, which is a, a disk seen edge on, we see this scattered light extending out to hundreds of AU. It's not because there are planetesimals out at hundreds of AU. The planetesimal belt is, is much closer in. Um, and the dust that we're seeing here is this halo of, of dust that's on these highly elliptical orbits. Okay, so that's, that's enough to get started on uh, thinking about debris disks. So how do planets perturb that, that picture? Well, there are three ways in which planets will inevitably perturb the orbits or disk particles. Uh, if you want more information on, on this, uh, uh, then I'll refer you to the Murray and Dermot book. Um, there are secular perturbations, resonances, uh, and scattering. The secular perturbations uh, are equivalent, they're the long-term effect of, of the planets, and they're equivalent to spreading the mass of the planet around its orbit along a wire, which means that the particles in the disk are no longer orbiting uh, a point mass star that gives them an elliptical orbit, they're more orbiting the point mass star plus this, plus this wire, and that wire uh, causes the orbits of the, the particles to evolve. And they cause everything, and this is uh, relevant to everything in the disk. Resonances, on the other hand, are only uh, uh, applicable at certain locations in the disk. They're applicable to particles that are orbiting an a ratio of two integers. Their, their orbital period is a ratio of two integers times the orbital period of the planet. Um, scattering uh, is a, a process that is fairly easy to understand. It, it occurs when a, a planetesimal or an object comes close to a planet. Okay, so I'm going to go through these three uh, types of, of perturbations uh, in turn and I start with secular perturbations. So I've given you the, the physical basis for, for what these are. Um, what about the, the maths? Well, the way they, these orbits evolve it, is, is such that the, the orbits process around circles when defined in a, when plotted in, in, in an appropriate way. So for example, um, if a 
particles or orbit is defined by this point D, then the eccentricity of that orbit is given by the distance from the origin. And this angle here gives the orientation of the pericenter. And the secular perturbations of a planet that is on an eccentric orbit or from a, a full planetary system uh, as well, it doesn't just apply if, if it's one planet. The, the evolution is that that uh, particle's orbit processes around a circle, uh, the center of which is not defined by the particle, it's only defined by uh, the, the planets. The precession rate is also only defined by the planets, as well as where the, the planet is. Um, and there's a similar um, way of plotting the orbital plane of the particle, and again, that processes uh, around, uh, around the circle. Okay, so that's what um, circular perturbations are doing. What does this do to the disk? Um, well, it's quite easy to, to, to plot this out because the evolution is, uh, can be described by just one simple uh, analytical uh, equation. And that shows that, gives you this picture of, of, of how a disk is, uh, is perturbed by, by, a, by a planet. In, in this, um, in this model, we've got a disk that extends from 20 AU out to 60 AU, and it starts off coplanar and on circular orbits. And it's perturbed by a planet that is um, uh, in at 5 AU, it's a Jupiter mass planet, it's on an eccentricity of 0.1, and it's inclined by five degrees to the, to the disk's orbital plane. And this image here shows the spatial distribution of planetesimals after 100 million years. And because of these circles that the orbits are processing around, and the fact that the precession happens faster for uh, material that is closer to the planet, this causes, because of the planet's eccentricity, this tightly wound spiral structure to propagate through the disk. Very close to the planet, where the precession, rate has, got, precession has gone around many times, we find that the orbits start overlapping so that the planetesimals can start colliding and getting ground down into, into dust. Um, and we find that after, on a long time scale, this, this whole inner edge here um, becomes eccentric. Um, so the center of symmetry of the disk will be offset from, from the star. When we look at the, uh, the effect of the planet's inclination, it causes this, uh, this warp because essentially it's trying to force the disk to be aligned with its orbit, but it does so faster for material closer to it than that that's further away. So we get this, uh, this warp. And uh, there's several uh, papers that have been, been written on this, um, either just using that uh, uh, simple picture of spatial distribution of the planetesimals and the, the latest one here, the Nesvold and, and Kuchner model includes the effect of collisions, the fact that collision, the collision rate would be different at different points in the disk. Okay, so the picture I've just described was, was valid for low eccentricity and low inclination planets. Um, and, uh, and things uh, are very similar when the planet has a high eccentricity or a high inclination relative to the, to the disk. But things can become uh, slightly more complicated. So these uh, these are n-body simulations here that show the response of of a disk to a planet that is on here in the top ones. A planet's on an eccentric, very eccentric orbit. And what we find here is that, or very similar to what was ha happening before, we have precession around well, circles that start becoming becoming squashed, and, and you end up with a disk that is that is elliptical, but we, it's much more extreme. We have a, a disk that has an inner edge that is aligned with the planet's orbit. When the planet is uh, very highly inclined to the disk, then you can get something, a result that's potentially counterintuitive because the precession is still around a circle, but now it's not centered on the orbital plane of the planet. So you don't end up with a disk that is, uh, that is symmetrical about the planet's orbit it ends up symmetrical about a plane that is orthogonal to the planet's orbit if the planet's inclination is high enough. So you can get what, a, uh, what could be called polar disks where the material is going around, is on orbits that are, uh, are 90 degrees to the, to the planet's orbital plane. And these aren't just theoretical uh, concepts. 
they have actually been observed in the context of binary stars. We've observed disks that are on polar orbits around an inner binary. Now, some of the secular perturbations are easy to understand how, how you might they might manifest themselves in observations. If you see a, a, a spiral or if you see a, a disk to be warped, um, the, the effect of a, an eccentric disk uh, is you'd think would be relatively easy to to understand. But the observables that you get from this are actually quite, quite diverse. Um, for example, if you look at a disk at low resolution, if you look at a ring at low resolution, this is the HR4796 uh, disk, which at higher resolution would look something, so, something like this, but at low resolution, it just looks like two blobs. Um, I, I showed back when I was doing my thesis that you, this asymmetry here, where one side is brighter than the other, could be caused by a uh, disk ring being eccentric, because if this the pericenter is up on this side, then this side would be closer to the star, and so therefore hotter and, and brighter. And I call this phenomenon a uh, pericenter glow. And Margaret Pan came along uh, several years later and, and pointed out that um, you don't it's not necessarily always the pericenter side that is, is brightest, because this side might be hotter, but actually material also orbits much slower at apocenter, so there is more material at apocenter. And she showed that, that actually whether you get a pericenter or apocenter glow depends on the wavelength of the observation. We've got pericenter glow here because we were looking in the mid infrared, which is very uh, temperature dependent. Uh, whereas if you look at longer wavelengths, then you get uh, an apocenter, apocenter glow. Of course, nowadays, we don't just have these low resolution observations, we have these much higher resolution observations, which means we don't have to just infer that there's an eccentricity, we can see that there's an eccentricity. And then we can do something uh, much more clever, that we can infer not just that there's an eccentricity, but we can look at the distribution of eccentricities within the disk. For example, this is the same um, phase space I was describing before, where you have the the particles orbits processing around uh, around circles, and what uh, Grant Kennedy was able to do for the formal hot disk was to work out uh, what the distribution of the uh, particles is on this plane to see whether it's tightly constrained around around a single point or whether there's a broader distribution. And this is, of course, telling us something about the uh, what's going on within the disks. And that, as if that wasn't uh, enough eccentricity observables, uh, take this uh, paper by Lian Chiang, who looked at uh, uh, the effect of having an eccentric planetesimal belt and including now the effect of radiation pressure on the small dust and the halo that is produced. And they showed how you can get a, a wide range of, uh, of observational phenomena called you know, the moth and the needle and the ship and wake, for, for example, that depend on the orientation, the inclination of the disk to the line of sight and the orientation of the pericenter within, within that. So you can get a wide, wide range of structures just from this eccentric, uh, eccentric ring. And the, the story hasn't finished. There's the uh, sender and, and learner uh, pointed out that for these, when you look at these small dust, um, the procession around the circle happens at a different rate for the parent planetesimals to the small dust that is that is in the halo, which means that um, the halo might be misaligned in terms of its pericenter orientation with the parent belt, which could explain why some disks look like they have different pericenters for the big grains compared to the small grains. So I'm going to be moving on in a second to, to resonances. So uh, a good segue is to talk about secular resonances um, first. Now, secular resonances occur in a multi-planet system because uh, and they occur at regions where the uh, the precession rate around the circle that I was uh, just just talking about is uh, the same rate at which one of the planets orbits is processing. And in a multiple planet system, then the planets mutually interact, and so they cause each other to to process. And so that mutual interaction can cause precession at the same rate as some location in the disk. Um, for example, this is. Uh, a snapshot in time of the eccentricity versus semi-major axis in, in a disk. 
um, in a system, in a two planet system that has a secular resonance that is that is here. You can see these kind of these bumps here of what caused the uh, spiral that I was showing you showing you bef before. Um, but you see that at the location of the secular resonance is the eccentricities become high. And this causes a gap to be carved in the disk because material is pushed away, it spends more time at apocenter. It also causes the collision rate to get, to get higher in the disk at that point, which collisionally depletes that, that secular resonance region. And what uh, Ben Yelton showed was that you can get a, a distribution that, that has a, a gap if you have two planets orbiting inside a, a, a broad disk. Um, earlier this year, Antronik uh, Cephalian uh, showed that you get exactly the same structure. This you know, is essentially the same structure that was, was seen by, by, uh, by Ben Yelton's simulations of, of this um, crescent-shaped uh, gap here. Um, but he found you can get this not with a, in a multi-planet system, you can get this just with one planet for exactly the same reason as uh, for secular resonances. And this arises if the disk is massive. And that's because the planet, if the planet, if the disk is massive, then it causes, that can cause the planet's precession rate, planet's orbit to process. And that precession rate can be the same as the, lo uh, as the precession rate that you would expect within at some location in the disk. And with this uh, perspective in mind, um, uh, Andronic showed how for the HR, HD 107146 disk, which has a, a gap, how its gap could constrain what planet could be causing um, its, uh, could be causing that gap. So this is planet mass against semi-major axis and the, the shaded regions are excluded. The planet can't be uh, too low in mass because uh, the time scale on, on which it takes to carve the gap is, is too long. The planet can't be too massive. Otherwise, uh, the disk would have to be unphysically massive to, co to cause a, a gap at the right location. And the planet can't be too close to the disk for reasons that I'll come to in a, in a moment. So you end up with this uh, parameter space where the planet that could be carving an observed gap could be. And while it's still fairly, uh, fairly broad, you cannot, can also think of this in another way which is if that you ha have a system in which you see a gap and there's an interior planet that you know where it is, and there are some, uh, at least one example of, of, of this, then you can use the location of the gap to weigh the disk because you know where the planet is, you know how massive the disk must be to cause the gap at the same location. And that gives us uh, quite unique information on how massive the, the disk is, which otherwise we have very little uh, handle on. Okay, so resonances. Now, by resonances, I, I mean mean motion resonances now rather than secular resonances. Um, and the, uh, the, the physics of what's going on here is it's, it's all down to geometry, and that's summarized in this, uh, this movie here. So this just shows the, um, the orbits of a, uh, a comet that's in three to two resonance with a planet. Um, and the pluses are plotted at equal time steps. Um, and there's no dynamical interaction between the planet and the comet. They're just going around, the comet's just going around twice for every three times that the planet uh, goes around. And it, but if you plot this in the rotating frame, the frame where the planet uh, stays, stays fixed, then you see that the, the comet does this kind of loopy pattern. It spends most of its time over here or over here, 90 degrees away from the planet. And every time it gets close to, to the planet, it's always, at apocenter, and it's that special geometry that is what is uh, causing resonances to be uh, to be so special. Um, now, before we move on, there's only uh, I think there's a couple of other things that are worth pointing out, which is um, that resonances do occur at specific semi-major axes. The, the semi-major axis where this the orbital period is that ratio of two integers times the orbital period of the planet, but they have finite width because. Um, the, you get this libration about that, uh, that, that exact lo location. So resonances have finite widths. And the other point is that the, um, uh, the first order resonances are the strongest ones. So the three to two, the four to three, five to four resonance will be the ones that are, that, that are the strongest. Okay, so that's um, what resonances are. So what do they do to the disk? Well, what, as I was just saying, the resonances have finite width. 
and the first order resonances are strongest. And what this means is that very close to a planet, all of those resonances overlap. And because of these overlapping resonances, this causes the, uh, the orbital evolution of particles close to the planet to be chaotic. And so that region close to the planet is depleted. And you can work out analytically how uh, what well, the size of that region would be, and the width is um, depends on the the mass of the planet. So larger mass planets carve out uh, wider uh, wider gaps. Um, it's not just the the width of the gap that is um, uh, determined by the planet mass, but also the shape of of the gap. So higher mass planets have shallower gaps, and this is. You know, summarized in this um, plot here, which shows the surface density as a function of, uh, of distance of, um, of particles outside a planet that is orbiting at, at 50 AU. So for a low mass planet, you get a, a very sharp gap um, that's close to the, to the planet. And for higher mass planets, you get a much shallower gap. Now it's a little bit more complicated uh, than that because it's going to depend on the eccentricity of the planet as well. It's also going to depend on the eccentricity of the particles, the shape of this gap. Um, and it's also going to depend on, uh, on age when we include collisions uh, as well. Um, but it is at least an observable. The shape of, of an edge of, of a disk is an observable quantity and it can be used to set constraints on the planet that might be shaping that that inner edge because it will shape it through these overlapping uh, overlapping resonances. Now, planets uh, resonances are not uh, just bad uh, locations um, uh, where they overlap. Individual resonances can be bad, and we know this from the solar system because the asteroid belt has gaps carved in it called the Kirkwood gaps at the interior resonances with with Jupiter, and these are the uh, the source of the near Earth asteroids. Uh, essentially, what's going on is you get an evolution that is uh, similar to what I was saying about um, uh, the secular perturbation. You get evolution of the orbital elements around a circle. The circles may become become squashed, but for these, uh, uh, if if the planet has an eccentric orbit and the eccentricity doesn't have to be very large, then the shape of the, uh, the these uh, this evolution can look something like this, where this is eccentricity up here. So it means that something can start off, objects that are in this resonance can start off with very circular orbits, but end up with very high eccentricity orbits. And when they end up with the high eccentricities, then they can start interacting with um, the, the planet that is, that, that is causing those perturbations or other planets in the system. So that's um, what's going on. This phase space isn't exactly the same as what I was we're showing four for resonances compared to secular perturbations, but the idea is uh, it is the same. And this uh, this mechanism has been proposed as the origin of the exocomets, the falling evaporating bodies that have been observed around Beta Pictoris. Um, they were inferred to come from the planet Beta Pic B that was also inferred from a warp in the in, in the disk the warp of the kind that I was discussing uh, earlier. And everything fitted together into a nice picture of how beta pic B, what we now know as beta pic B, is perturbing uh, objects in an asteroid belt interior to it, and the Kirkwood gaps within that are, are scattering in comets that we then see passing in front of the star. And Virginie uh, Faramans has uh, uh, extended this idea to, to think about how it could be causing exocomets in other systems as well. Um, Tabeshian and, and, and Bigot, um, uh, also consider whether this could be causing uh, gaps in a disk. Could, could this cause observable gaps? And this is one of their simulations, which shows you can see the distribution of uh, of planetesimals in this in this M body simulation shows gaps. And this comes from the uh, mean motion resonances that uh, are depopulated because because of this process. Now resonances are not always bad. Resonances can also be good. Um, this uh, uh, we know again from the solar system because we have many objects in the Kuiper belt that are trapped in resonance with Neptune, like Pluto, for example. And this comes from a process of resonant trapping where what's happened in the solar system is Neptune has migrated outwards. And as it migrated outwards, its resonances swept outwards through the Kuiper belt. And as it did so, 
some of the objects got trapped into those resonances and then migrated out with the with Neptune, having their eccentricities pumped up as they uh, as they migrated out. Now, because of the uh, particular geometry of, of resonances, what happens as you as you as the planet migrates out and more planet are trapped in resonance, you get this clumpy structure uh, appearing in in the disk, um, where for the simulation that is uh, that is shown here, we get we get two uh, two clumps from the the three to two resonance because that that was the geometry that I was uh, uh, was showing in the last in the last movie. Anyway, you get different clumpy structures depending on the resonances that are that are populated, and what this means is if we observe clumpy structures in other uh, debris disks, and we can use that to tell something about not just the fact that there is a planet there and that it has migrated outwards, but how fast it would have must have migrated and how massive it must be to cause the kind of clumpy structure that that we see. Of course, we have to uh, take into account, as always, that we're not seeing planetesimals, but we're seeing dust. And this does have an effect on, on the resonances, because if planetesimals are, are, while planetesimals may be trapped in resonance, the small dust is affected by radiation forces. And because they see a smaller mass star, they have a different orbital period. And so they're not necessarily going to be uh, trapped in resonance anymore. And what this means is that in this simulation here, we've got uh, a planet that has migrated outwards and trapped planetesimals in resonances that cause, causes this very bright clump over here. But by the time you get down to the smallest dust that is still bound to the star, it falls out of the resonance, and so it has an axisymmetric distribution. In fact, the very smallest dust that gets blown up by radiation pressure, you get this, you again get the clump, this clumpy structure because the small dust starts its unbound trajectories at the location where it was created in a collision, and collisions happen most frequently in the, in the clumps. So you get this uh, very wide spiral-like like structure. And what this means is that you expect to see different structures in a debris disk as a function of the grain size that you're looking at. And that means that when you look at different wavelengths, you would expect to see different structures. And, and indeed, in some systems like beta pic we do see structures that, uh, that change when you look at different wavelengths that, that may be potentially explained by this. But the topic of beta pic is, is, a <clears throat> is, is more than I can cover in, in this talk. Okay, uh, Tim Pierce showed earlier this, this year another way in which uh, resonances can be uh, uh, overpopulated in a disk. It's not so much that the resonances become over become uh, preferentially populated uh, as they did in the last model because they uh, they got material was trapped within them. In this case, the it's not the resonances which are populated, but everything else which is which is depopulated. So they applied this to, to Fomenhort, which is a system that we know has a narrow belt, but it also has uh, an object, Fomenhort B, that looks like it's on an orbit that is crossing the uh, crossing this belt. And what um, Hervé Boost and Dan Tamayo had, had shown already was that, well, it doesn't take very long for a, for a planet to turn this co nice coherent structure into this, this uh, broad mess, which argues against uh, this being uh, being a planet. And what Tim was showing was if you look at these simulations and take them up to much longer timescales, then you find that, well, I had to make some, some additional assumptions, but you, you deplete all of uh, uh, many of these particles, and the only ones that remain uh, on long timescales are those that are trapped in resonance. So the planet decimals that uh, remained in their simulations were the ones that were in, uh, in resonance with the planets because of that special geometry I was describing before, because they don't have close interactions uh, with the planet. And if you then consider the dust that comes from them that falls out of resonance, then you can get a structure that looks uh, very similar to, to that, that observed. So resonances can be, can be, can be good. Right, so for the final, final um, <clears throat> topic of, uh, of scattering, um, well, the, the physics of what's going on here is much easier to understand. Um, it, you have an orbit that is 
crossing that of, of a planet and then probabilistically they, those orbits might uh, come very close at, at some point, uh, in which case you can have a, a close encounter and the orbit of a, uh, of a comet gets impulsively changed onto a, onto a different orbit because of that close encounter. The, out, the ultimate outcome of, of that process, if you've just got comets interacting with one planet, is summarized on this figure here. This shows planet mass against semi-major axis. There's an important line here, which is where the escape velocity of the planet is equal to its orbital velocity. And the ultimate fate of the comet, if planets are to the left of this line, is for them to hit the, hit the planet. And for those that are to the right, they're most likely to be ejected from the planetary system. Other lines that are important on here are these blue ones here, because these give the time scale for that ultimate fate to happen. And what that shows is that for planets, comets that are interacting with planets that are down in this bottom right corner, the time scale for them to achieve that fate is longer than the age of the system. So there, they would still be uh, remaining in, in the system, whereas other ones that are up, up here would be likely be lost. You may be interested in this little bit of parameter space here, which is comets that can get implanted into the Oort cloud, uh, but I'm not going to uh, discuss that. Okay, so regardless of the um, of the ultimate fate of the planetesimals, the main effect of scattering is uh, to remove the planetesimals, whether they collide with the planet or if they're ejected. For example, if we look at these uh, late heavy bombardment simulations from Gomez et al, then we see that um, the Kuiper belt was uh, initially massive with um, the giant planets in inside it. At some point, Neptune got scattered into the belt, and what happened was that then scattered all of the, uh, the planetesimals <clears throat> in the Kuiper belt, depleting it so that in the end, we end up with uh, very few, uh, few planetesimals left. There's uh, only 1% of the original mass is remaining in the Kuiper belt today. Um, now, uh, this is not necessarily a good thing for being able to observe a, a debris. So we don't think that the debris disks that we see have uh, undergone a, uh, such a, an instability and, and a clearing because we can see them. But of course, this kind of clearing process by, by scattering uh, does not have to be complete. There could be a disk that remains outside it. And you don't need the instability for scattering within a planetary system to deplete planetesimals in the first place. And some people have, have used this um, to, uh, to consider, given a system's age, what kind of planetary system could be present to have cleared all of their inner region. So there are some useful uh, uh, results in there, if you wish to interpret a cleared gap in a system to, to determine the planet mass that is required to, to have caused that clearing. Of course, it takes some time for, for the disk to be cleared and on its way to being cleared, um, the main effect of, uh, of the scattering is to cause the disk to become broader. So for example, we take those uh, late heavy bombardment simulations I was showing you just now and look at the surface density distribution within them, then while it started off with a, a, a radially confined, confined belt in the middle of the time when Neptune was in the belt and doing the scattering, you get this, this very broad, uh, a much broader structure and a much broader structure than we see today. And we see this, this broad disk in the, in the Kuiper belt today of um, Kuiper belt objects that are being scattered by Neptune and are on their way out. They're on their way to the, um, to the Oort cloud. Um, so the main Kuiper belt is here, but we see this, um, this broad scattered disk of objects that have pericenters close to Neptune that are undergoing multiple scatterings. <clears throat> and this has been, it's been inferred that we might be seeing analogous um, scattered disks around other stars. So this was uh, the distribution of parent body um, orbits inferred for the HR8799 disk. So it, it may have uh, a scattered disk component within it. Now, scattering can move uh, objects outwards, as uh, <clears throat> yeah, as as I was just discussing for the for the scatter disk. But it can also move uh, 
material inwards. And if it's if um, material gets scattered inwards, then it can encounter another planet uh, closer in in the planetary system and then get scattered inwards to the next planet in. And we get this chain of, uh, of, of if we have a chain of planets then we can pass comets all the way into the inner region of the system where they can um, sublimate, um, pass in front of the star or um, disintegrate in, in some way. So they, so they, they can then feed the, um, the exozoidy, uh, they can feed a component of, of dust that we might see much closer to the star. And indeed, this is what happens in, in the solar system. We have comets being passed from the Kuiper belt by Neptune, Uranus, and then Saturn, and then Jupiter, which scatters them into the inner solar system where we see them as comets and where they do deposit their dust that is seen as the zodiacal cloud. And the same thing might be happening in uh, uh, an extra solar system where we have an outer belt, a chain of planets which we don't see, and then material is being scattered in. Some of it gets ejected on the way, some of it gets accreted onto the planets, but some of it can reach the inner regions where it feeds uh, an exozody. And this is uh, good because it means that we can use observations of exozody to tell us something about the planets that might be doing this scattering. The problem uh, is that understanding that scattering is not uh, an easy process. We don't have a simple analytical expression to tell us how much material gets scattered into an exozody for a given planetary system. So we have to resort to these uh, M-body simulations, and then we're largely unconstrained in what kind of planetary system is, uh, is there. But um, Seba Marino did some simulations to, uh, to look at this, to try and interpret observations of the Eta Corvi system that does have an outer Kuiper belt, and it does have a, uh, a bright exozody, and asked the question of what kind of planetary system could be in between to, to, to cause the exozody that we see. And uh, his conclusion was summarized on this plot. That, so if we have a chain of, of equal mass planets given by this planet mass being fed at a, at a, at a certain rate from the, from the outer belt, then uh, the planet mass planets can't be, um, can't be too large. If they're too, too large, then uh, they basically eject all the comets before they make it to the inner region. Uh, they can't be too low mass either, because if they, they're too low mass and they don't eject enough, and you end up with uh, seeing the comets in the region between the outer Kuiper belt and the inner exozoidy. Um, and so you, you can narrow down the kind of parameter space that could be uh, this chain of, uh, of planets could have if it was going to explain the, um, uh, the, the exozoidy. And now the process, uh, the, this, this is uh, far from a, a very complete model because it hadn't considered the production of dust, how the comets, when they get in, how they produce the dust, and once they've produced it, how does that dust evolve? There's been some progress on models uh, along those lines uh, by both Marbeuf and, and Elisa Zestre, um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. This is a very complex problem to, to model uh, exocomets. Now, while the exocomet models are still, I guess, in their, in their early stages, models for, there's another kind of model that, that may be able to explain exozody, the hot dust we see uh, close to, to stars that doesn't involve planets at all. And these are much uh, further developed. Um, so in this, we have an outer belt because we know we have a, a, an outer belt in the system. And then radiation pressure might push dust away, but pointing Robertson drag is another component of the radiation force and that drags dust inwards makes it migrate inwards towards towards the star. Now I ignored this before because there's a uh, there's a good reason why pointing Robertson drag is normally insignificant in a, the, the kind of debris disks that we're looking at. Uh, it can be summarized in this, this simple model that I, I came up with in 2005. If you consider a planetesimal belt that's producing dust of just a single size and say that then evolves due to mutual collisions that destroys it and pointing Robertson drag that brings it in, then the surface density that you get as a function of distance, where this is the planetesimal belt here, um, just depends on the ratio of the pointing Robertson drag time scale to the collision time scale. And you get a distribution that just depends on the optical depth in the disk. And what we find is that for uh, very low density disks that would be like the solar system and the zodiacal cloud, then all of the dust migrates inwards without suffering a collision, and you get a flat surface density distribution. So you get uh, 
a bright disk all, all the way in, but for the disks that are bright enough to detect, they're very dense. And so then the dust doesn't migrate very far before being uh, suffering a collision and then getting depleted. So you get a large uh, inner hole. And you can show that the disks that, that we can detect, the debris that we know about, um, they're going to look, look, like, look like this. Now, while this means that um, uh, the disk might look, look like this, there's always some dust that makes it in. So while we, if we're interpreting the observation of the outer, outer Kuiper belt, we don't need to consider pointing romps and drag. If we want to consider what the dust that makes it into the inner region, then this pointing Roberts and dragged in component can be significant. Now the models have got much much better. They've included a, a size distribution. It's been followed. They've been followed uh, numerically rather than just simply analytically. And those numerical results have been included in analytical models to be able to produce a quick answer of, uh, of what the, the dust distribution you would expect is. And this is uh, one summary from Jess Wrigley's paper, which shows the amount of uh, mid-infrared emission that you'd expect to detect with LBTI as a function of the outer belt radius um, in these models as shown with these, these lines here. And you can see that for belts that are uh, similar to those uh, that we see around tens to 100 AU, then the amount of null that you would expect to detect is between a few tenths of percent and a, and a few percent, and very broadly similar to the nulls that have been have been detected. So it's plausible that we have detected this, um, this dragged in dust components in, in some of these systems. Eta Corby still lies up here as, as an outlier, so it can't be explained by, by this model, I should point out. Um, so this is good because this means that, well, because this dust dragged in dust component is inevitable, the dust is going to get dragged in. And, uh, and, and it means that we can detect it. It also means that the, the dust that we're detecting must have interacted with the planets on its way in because it will have to pass, pass the planets. And so we'll be undergoing the same secular resonant and, and scattering uh, interactions that we've, we were discussing previously within the context of the planetesimals. Um, Amy Bontor looked at the, uh, the effect of planetary, uh, planets scattering the dust <clears throat> in, a, in a recent paper, and that's summarized in this plot here. This shows as a function of planet mass and semi-major axis, the fraction of dust that gets ejected in, the, in this color scale um, for dust that has a beta of, of 0.01. So this is the fraction of dust that is, is ejected um, as it migrates past a planet. And you can see that if a planet is massive, then a large fraction of the dust is ejected before ever making it into the inner regions. And what this means is you can use an observation of the mid-infrared axis, which you know should be there because the dust should be dragged in from an outer belt. So you've got a system that has an outer belt and it doesn't have a mid-infrared detection, then the reason that it doesn't have a detection could be because the dust which should have made it in was ejected by a planet uh, on its way in. And Amy applied this to the observations of Vega and showed the kind of constraints that you would get. They weren't significant. The observations aren't, aren't significant at the moment to be able to draw firm conclusions, but these are the kind of conclusions that, that we would get um, for a non-detection, which is that the planet that is causing it would have to be above around Saturn in mass. So if there are Saturn mass planets orbiting far out in these systems, then we might be able to infer that from the lack of mid-infrared emission in, in the system. Now, as the dust migrates inwards, it also encounters the planet's resonances and it can become trapped in the same way that planetesimals were trapped by those migrating resonances. A migrating dust grain can get trapped in resonance with a planet. It doesn't stay there forever. Eventually, it will uh, find its way out of, the, out of the resonance and continue its migration inwards or get scattered out by the planet. Um, but we can... Uh, uh, <clears throat> We can try and try and figure out what what kind of uh, dust structures uh, we get, um, and we know that the, this trapping does occur because it occurs in the solar system. The Earth has a a, a resonant ring that's associated with with it. That's uh, a model for that is shown down here. We have the Earth here. It has a a clump of of dust that follows it around its its orbit, 
And there have been resonant rings that have also been reported recently for, for Venus and for, for Mercury as well. Um, these, this resonant uh, trapping models were, were applied quite early on to interpretation of debris disks. Um, and they were, you know, to some extent, the reason why I, I wrote the paper saying that pointing Roberts and drag was uh, irrelevant or in, insignificant in extrasolar debris disks because the disks that we were observing were collisional and so they couldn't have been applied, uh, to, this mechanism couldn't have been applied to them. But that's irrelevant because these models did show the range of structures that you can get and the kind of structures that we will get in, in lower density disks. And we can get, we get a, a wide variety of structures depending on the mass of the planet and what its eccentricity, uh, what its eccentricity is. But those models were uh, still only not excluding collisions and people have now uh, been able to include collisions in, in such models. You know, using the collisional grooming models, uh, Chris Stark came, uh, uh, came up with the, the following model. In each of these three panels, we have a planetesimal belt that is roughly coincident with this, this red circle here. It's colliding to produce, uh, to, to produce dust that is characterized by this, this eta parameter, which is the ratio of the pointing Roberts and drag timescale to the collision timescale. So in a disk, this disk here, we've got, um, got no collisions operating. So the dust just migrates inwards and it would make it all the way into the star, except that it passes a planet's resonance. The planet is, is here. It passes the planet's resonances, gets trapped. And so you end up with this, this clumpy structure. As the density of the disk goes up, um, then we find that uh, collisions become more important. So, so now the planetesimal, uh, the dust doesn't migrate very far before being collisionally depleted, but some dust does make it in and you still get this structure. It's just um, less prominent. Okay, so the models, uh, these, these models, uh, I think it's fair to say, still need uh, improvement. No collisional dust production was it, it included in, it, in here, for example. Um, but what this does show is uh, the kind of implications that we might have for exoplanet imaging. And they can be both good and bad. For example, clumps that we see in a, in a disk can provide confusion. It could look to some uh, imaging or uh, interferometric techniques, it could look like a mission from a planet. It's a mission that is moving or also on a Keplerian orbit, for example. So the clumps can provide confusion, but they can also be a good thing because they, they can also be a signature of a planet. For example, if we look at uh, a, a disk and we see an image, a structure that looks like this, then we can infer that there would have to be a planet there and we can use uh, the models to tell us something about the kind of planet that would have to be there to be causing, uh, to be causing that structure. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for my uh, for my talk. To to conclude, we know that debris disks are to first order. They're planetesimal belts at tens of AU, and they're getting depleted in mutual collisions. Planets uh, will inevitably perturb these belts, and as well as the dust that comes from them, it, in multiple ways, and these can cause a, a wide variety of structures. We've got secular resonance perturbations and scattering perturbations, and they cause a wide range of, uh, of features. And in fact, this set of features that they could cause uh, corresponds very well with a set of features that it actually is observed. Uh, it's fair to say that there's still a long way to go in, in improving the realism of these models because the physics is, is complicated, in particular when there's multiple uh, processes uh, operating at the same time, such as uh, when we're trying to model uh, cometary scatter scattering. But the benefits are, are uh, tangible that we can use observations of these structures to tell us something about, about the planetary system. And this is important, not just now where we're learning uh, mostly about planets that are out in the outer regions of the system, the, the outer Neptunes, uh, at, as it were, um, but they're also important um, for you know, long-term goals, such as the uh, imaging detect and detection of, of Earth-like planets. And I shall leave it there. Thank you for, for making it all the way to the end.